on this windy cold night. My name is Denise Almeo and I'm here uh, on behalf of the director Janine Parkinson who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight for family reasons. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the New Zealand Portrait Gallery and to the fourth edition of our annual Ovenden Lecture. Um, surrounding you as you sit here are the 45 finalist works from this year's Adam Portraiture Award. If you haven't viewed, seen them already, I hope you'll take an opportunity after the lecture to look around at them and also to explore the paintings in the front gallery, which are paintings, portraits from the collection of our beloved former director, Avon McKinnon. Um, tonight's lecture, as you know, was started four years ago to commemorate the splendid work that Dr. Keith Ovenden did to uh, put the gallery on a professional footing, together with Sir Michael Hardy Boys and Avon McKinnon. And this lecture is to follow developments in portraiture and to share the views of experts in the field with us every year. I hope you will enjoy the evening. For those of you who are not familiar with the gallery, there are toilets at the rear, this side, and in the event of a fire, if we have to leave the gallery, the gathering place is outside the front doors in front of the Mojo brick shed opposite. The bu building has been earthquake strengthened, so if there is a shake, uh, we'll just wait and see, and hopefully it will pass quickly, but um, we won't move unless it's required. So um, with, with no more ado, oh, I should also mention that we are recording tonight's lecture. It will be on our website site in a few days. And uh, so it, the text will not be, but the lecture will be there, in, videoed and for you to watch at your leisure as well. And we, if uh, there are questions at the end of the lecture, Dr. Griffey is very happy to take them. So now I'd like to invite our chair, Dr. Alan Bollard, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, kia ora koutou, everybody. Welcome on a horrible night. Congratulations all on coming out to listen to this fourth Ovenden lecture. You, Denise told you about the origin of the lectures. They were originally named to commemorate the work that Keith Ovenden and others did. And Keith gave the first lecture uh, on enlarging the world in 2019, before COVID, if anybody can remember that. Keith and Helen are here in the front row in the unlikely event anyone doesn't already know them. Uh, the year following that, we had the late Lydia Weavers give a talk on house and street. And then last year, Neil Plimmer talked about three-dimensional portraiture, which we would know as a subset of sculpture. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce to you tonight uh, Dr. Erin Griffey. She's Associate Professor at the University of Auckland on the history of art. And she's got a doctorate in art history from the Courtauld Institute, uh, where she specialised in 17th century Netherlands portraiture. She's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. And she's already, although a decade ago, um, curated two exhibitions for us at the Portrait Gallery. You might remember The Power of Portraiture, uh, which came to us from the Gus Fisher Gallery in Auckland and focused on leadership in portrait art. and. Uh, Legacy, the Norrie Collection and other portraits from the Government House that we housed and exhibited while the Government House was going through a refurbishment. Uh, Dr Giffey wrote the catalogues for both of these exhibitions um, and they were the first foray that we've had into publishing such catalogues and so she's been here at a very pioneering stage for us in the gallery. Uh, Dr. Griffey is a specialist in early modern visual and material culture with a particular interest in aspects of adornment and display. So she's published widely on this topic, including books called On Display, Henrietta Maria and the Materials of Magnificence at the Stuart Court, Sartorial Politics in Early Modern Europe, Fashioning Women, and currently writing a book on beauty culture entitled Facing Decay 
beauty, wrinkles and anti-aging in early modern Europe. I'm not making any comment other than to say that when I was running the Reserve Bank about a decade ago, uh, time came to refurbish the coins of New Zealand and the coins have a relief image of Queen Elizabeth on them. Uh, we went back to Buckingham Palace and said, um, what image would you like us to have on these coins? And we got a rather haughty response saying, the Queen stopped ageing at 70, please continue with the current <laughs> images and you'll see those on the newer coins in New Zealand today. So tonight, Dr Griffey is going to talk about power politics, women and power in New Zealand portraiture, bringing together her interests in sartorial politics and leadership, and she'll discuss how the attributes of womanhood and symbols of power have been used by powerful female leaders in New Zealand and Britain. So thanks very much, Erin. We very much look forward to hearing you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Dr. Ballard. Um, and thank you very much, Denise, too. Thank you for coming out tonight. If, can you all hear me okay? okay? All right. So my talk is about 45 to 50 minutes, so get comfortable. Hopefully the images will be just as appealing as the text. Derek Henderson's photographic portrait of Jacinda Ardern, seen here, is a power portrait of a young labor leader who had just been elected Prime Minister of New Zealand. It was made for the March 2018 issue of American Vogue, which was dedicated to the most powerful women in the world. With Bethel's speech in the background, Jacinda Ardern is shown walking confidently with the wind blowing through her long hair, her long hair eyes fixed on the viewer, hands purposefully tucked in her pockets. That familiar wide smile we see in her campaign imagery and official photos is replaced by a serious expression that means business. Wearing clothes that marry pragmatism and fashion, a perfectly cut trench coat and elegant but restrained top and trousers. This is a portrait of a very modern and very fashionable prime minister. There are rich layers of association in this portrait, layers which provide a pathway to considering my topic tonight, power portraits, and the complex relationships between women and power in New Zealand portraiture, and one might add, in New Zealand government. We will return to this portrait and others of Jacinda Ardern later. She has certainly been a beacon for portrait painters, alongside national and international popularity. Of course, Jacinda Ardern is also a polarizing figure. All politicians are. To analyze how New Zealand female politicians have negotiated their representation in life and in art shows just how complex and layered such negotiation is. The convention of portraying leaders are well established and based on concepts and depictions of male power dating back to antiquity. And for this, we'll get, we'll get to this in a moment. Female monarchs and leaders have had to negotiate this tradition with male conventions of power. On the one hand, women need to legitimize their power through an, an accepted, long-standing language of power portraiture. But women must also conform to gendered female ideals of attractiveness. From power suits to symbolic jewelry, these details are all carefully choreographed and scrutinized. So my presentation tonight asks how portraits of New Zealand's female leaders have engaged in this dynamic, 
taking in painted and photographic portraits, high art and campaign imagery, both official and informal. Considering the Commonwealth connections and portrait legacy of English female monarchs, this talk discusses portraits of British queens and prime ministers, including Elizabeth II and Margaret Thatcher. And it underscores the distinctive features of New Zealand's female leaders, from Kath Tizard to Ginny Shipley, Helen Clark, and Jacinda Ardern. So now let's look at the next image. In a world saturated with images in print and online, today's leaders understand just how powerful images are in not just reflecting authority, but in sustaining and building that authority. Leaders are constantly in the public eye and photographed and filmed live regularly. So naturally their appearance is closely monitored by their advisors. It is no wonder that they have makeup artists, hair stylists, and wardrobe advisors to carefully counsel them. Helen Clark's appearance was analyzed throughout her political campaigns. The clothes she wore, how her hair was cut and styled, and even her use of lipstick. This photograph was taken in 2018 before a New Zealand Herald photo shoot alongside Jacinda Ardern and Jenny Shipley. Helen, Helen Clark is quoted to have said to Jenny Shipley greeting her, hello, 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 I'm having the paint job done this morning, end quote. This use of the word paint rather than lipstick, I think offers rather uncanny insight into Helen Clark's practical, if not rather bemused view of makeup for a female leader. In using the word paint, Helen Clark may have been cheekily referencing two newspaper articles about her appearance in the 2008 election campaign image seen here. These newspaper articles characterized her makeup as, oh, characterized her as upholding a, quote, makeup regime with, quote, professional applied war paint, end quote. This positions Clark as negotiating ideals of femininity alongside warrior-like masculinity and being criticized for it. This fraught negotiation characterizes other official portrayals of female leaders historically and in modern day New Zealand. While today's female leaders cannot control what is said about them, they can and do regulate their appearance. This is not new. But the circulation of a leader's image was far easier to regulate before the advent of photography in the 19th century and the media explosion of the 20th. Leaders are also increasingly controlling the dissemination of their image through their own social media channels. Traditionally, such regulation was accomplished through official images commissioned and approved by the leader. And these official images have been produced from ancient times. And this is an example of one such official image. And this, of course, of Helen Clark. But here's another example, a painted portrait. Okay. And, and in this case, a painted portrait to commission um, a person's time in office. The National Party commissioned this portrait of Ginny Shipley, the first female prime minister of New Zealand, and the first and to date only female leader of the National Party. Oh, no. We had, we have, yeah. Yes. Yes, we've had, an, well, I'll just say the first um, female leader of the National Party, which she led until 2001. This portrait, which is now in the collection of the New Zealand Portrait Gallery, was occasioned on her retirement 
and I'll come back to analyze it a bit later. But the point I want to emphasize now is that portraits of leaders have been commissioned and constructed to honor not only the subject, but the office he or she embodies. Such portraits function not simply as passive vessels of commemoration, but active agents in inciting political loyalty. These are portraits that quite literally create a face for ideals of authority. The question is, do female leaders need to wear and be portrayed wearing war paint, combining masculine and feminine ideals to be taken seriously as authoritative leaders? From ancient times, portraits have been a key part of leaders' political arsenal, especially for monarchs and emperors who were asserting absolute authority. Many of the portrait formats still used today to convey authority are ancient Roman in origin. The sculpted portrait, the equestrian portrait, and the portrait medal in profile pose. Here are two representative examples. And you see on the, on the left, a um, larger than life size, monumental sculpted work um, portrait of Augustus Caesar, the first Roman emperor. And on the right, an equestrian portrait of the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. As you can see here, the focus is on their military strength, their powers of self-control, their powers of oration, you know, hand gestures are so central to these early images of male absolute authority. And we will come back to reflect on these qualities and these values and how they are inflected in portraits of New Zealand leaders later on. And again, I'm thinking particularly of Jacinda Ardern, and I'm sure you were amongst um, everyone out there watching her regular speeches in around the COVID pandemic and people were regularly talking about her um, her use of hand gestures her quite pointed hand gestures the other key portrait format for ancient rulers and um, Alan Ballard has already um, referred to this um, tonight was the bust length profile portrait illustrated on a coin. The Roman dictator Julius Caesar was the first living person to put his own face on a coin, establishing a tradition that persists to this day. Note the use of the profile format on the front of the coin, while the back is used to represent symbolism. And um, in the case of this, um, this denarii, this is a, um, a Roman coin, on the back of it you see a cornucopia, which refers to the plenty of Caesar's reign, as well as a globe and a rudder. And from this time on, coins were used to control public opinion in favor of the ruler. This can inform how we analyze portraits on New Zealand coinage and banknotes today. With New Zealand's head of state, Queen Elizabeth II, depicted on coins in the same bus length format, but with New Zealand specific symbolism on the reverse, like the Kiwi on the reverse of the $1 coin. Seeing New Zealanders on banknotes, except the Queen's $20 bill, takes on particular currency in knowing this tradition. And in particular, I'm thinking of Kate Shepard on the $10 bill. While portraits were not widely commissioned in the Middle Ages, they proliferated in the Renaissance with the rediscovery of antiquity and the growing focus on the achievements of individuals. From the Renaissance, portraits were commissioned around key points in a leader's office, in particular the coronation, but also important military campaigns and successes. Queen Elizabeth 
the first of England, attempted to control her visual persona. And in fact, in 1563, her main advisor, William Cecil, issued a proclamation. This said that no one could paint, draw, or print her image unless she approved, and I quote, a natural representation that could serve as a pattern. Crucially, what was natural was not necessarily what we would call realistic, but what the queen deemed appropriate to the office of monarch. And so throughout Elizabeth's reign, the natural images she endorsed represented her, in fact, in a highly stylized manner with a mask of unaging white skin. No one laughed at the early modern equivalent of photoshopping. Her perfect white skin was central to her visual persona as a virgin queen. Now this portrait, known as the Armada portrait, was made to commemorate the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. So what I'm pointing to here is a portrait of a, of a female monarch who is presenting herself within paradigms of ideal female beauty, but she has to do this alongside also trumpeting the traditional male values. And here she's very much promoting the military might of the English Navy and her control of power. As you can imagine too, it wasn't just the subject matter that was so um, potent, it was where these pictures were displayed. And indeed they were displayed in the corridors of power to be seen in the palaces. Whether painted portraits like the bombastic Armada portrait here or in a commemorative medal like this one, Elizabeth and her advisors carefully stage managed her image to communicate not only her power, but what this was based on, female and male paradigms of virtue and authority. As such, female rulers have had to bridge two roles, beauty and military and intellectual acumen. Note not only the symbolism of the Armada fleet in the background, but her prominent gesture with her hand resting authoritatively on top of the globe, as if in command not only of her navy, but her people and the whole world. Now this is combined with another notable feature of Elizabeth's portraits, and one we will return to regularly in looking at modern day female leaders the choice of dress. As you can see, Elizabeth's body is richly adorned in a spectacular ensemble of rich silks, ribbons, and enormous jewels. Her body is shaped and enlarged by the garments, garments which extend her shoulders, and the shoulders are all padded out, and this mimics male dress to broaden her shoulders. It is as if she is wearing, wearing a kind of sartorial armor fashioned not from metal, but from magnificent silks and jewels. Elizabeth's bodily emotional control, power over land and man, is most powerfully staged in this iconic image. This is the largest portrait of Elizabeth and you can see I've even put the dimensions. I mean, it really is um, enormous. And it was commissioned by Sir Henry Lee. And Henry Lee was very closely involved in the control of her public image. Lee retired from the court in 1590 to live at his family seat in Oxfordshire. But he didn't just leave on his own. When he left, he left with one of Elizabeth's ladies in waiting and he left to live with her at his family seat um, as his mistress. 
He did not get royal permission for this, and this infuriated the queen. To beg for her forgiveness, Lee organized a lavish entertainment in September 1592. This portrait was part of that gesture, showing his supplication and her power. He is shown clearly as a divine ordained, a divinely ordained monarch standing on top of a map. The sun reflects her glory and the thunder her power. An ornament hangs from her ear in the shape of a celestial sphere, another reference to her divine power. Look at how she stands with her feet on Oxfordshire, the site of Henry Lee's seat. Like her gesture of her hand on the globe in the Armada portrait, she has authority over land, over nature, over man. She does this while dressed in a spectacularly rich dress, white, encrusted with diamonds and rubies, her carefully fashioned body, body dominating land, but also all the space around her. Wearing a huge farthingale under her skirt to extend her dress in the space it commands, and with heavily padded shoulders, this is a queen with traditionally masculine authority over nature and gendered female adornment of the body. This approach in aligning female ideals with male iconography of rule was not specific to Elizabeth. And I thought I would throw in someone completely outside um, an English or Commonwealth or New Zealand context and this is Queen Christina of Sweden. And Queen Christina of Sweden is a particularly good example because she commissioned so many portraits of herself in some of these time-honored um, formulas that we traditionally associate with male portraiture, going back to ancient Rome. And Queen Christina, so she's um, in the 17th century, so she's about 100 years after Elizabeth, but she commissioned a whole room of sculpted portraits of her, which announce her authority and ambitions. Commemorated in marble, this creates a connection with a lineage of rulers going back to Roman emperors. And like Elizabeth, Christina recognized the currency of ancient Roman portrait forms like the metal or the coin, the portrait on a coin. And um, here, really spectacular, on the front of this commemorative medal, Christina is an army, in armor, invoking Athena, goddess of wisdom, and traditional male paradigms of power. And on the reverse, a sun, symbol of, um, uh, again, a symbol of her, Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Again, so the sun was a universal symbol of absolute power in this period, in the Renaissance and in the Baroque period. And we today, we think of the Sun King as Louis XIV, but this is just a very generic symbol of authority. And to me, it's quite notable that you have a female queen, sovereign queen, who embraces the sun as her emblem, just like Louis XIV and Philip IV of Spain. And Christina too. Um, embraced equestrian portraits like this one that she sent as a gift to the King of Spain. So here you see in a period we describe as the early modern period, the Renaissance and Baroque periods, how female monarchs, these are queens regnant, you know, heads of state, how they try to announce through their portraiture their authority in ways that are traditionally associated with male power. They wanted to be taken seriously as rulers. 
the tried and tested formats and conventions of portraiture established by Roman emperors and embraced by Elizabeth I and Queen of Christina continue to be embraced in portraits of Queen Elizabeth, as these examples attest. Equestrian imagery is central to Queen Elizabeth's portrayed image in photographs and commissions like these. You see a painted equestrian portrait in the uniform of the Scots Guard, a silver jubilee crown coin, and a larger than life size bronze equestrian statue installed at Windsor Great Park to commemorate her golden jubilee. This equestrian iconography is far more than a celebration of her love of horses or her accomplishments as a rider. This invokes historically rich connections with male military feats on the battlefield. In the background of Leonard Bodden's equestrian portrait, you see a triumphal arch. This is an ancient Roman architectural form erected to celebrate military victories. My point is, this is not subtle imagery. This points to claims to military prowess. The sculpted bust has also been embraced in commissions of the Queen, such as this one to commemorate her accession to the throne. Life-size portraits too celebrate the Queen and take the place of her in strategic positions in her palaces, not only in England, but take the place of her throughout the Commonwealth. In New Zealand, and I think this is still the case, um, someone will have to correct me who's been there more recently than me, um, in pride of place in the ballroom at Government House, where investitures take place, is this monumental, elegant depiction of the Queen in white evening dress, proudly wearing the sash and star of the Order of the Garter. Commissioned by Governor General Lord Cobham, it has hung in this place of honor for over 60 years, unless it has been supplanted by something else. Like her namesake, Elizabeth, in the Ditchley portrait, she wears a voluminous white gown. Moreover, these grandiose portraits, grand in scale, grand in imagery, participate in claims to power and are publicly positioned to maximize visibility. Portraits to mark Elizabeth's coronation were widely disseminated and still hang across the country in government institutions from the national to the local. Thus, this long reigning Queen Elizabeth II presents a remarkable model of tradition in many respects in terms of portraits of male leaders going back to antiquity. But she has also been willing to be the subject of really quite innovative portraits by artists like Lucian Freud and Chris Levine, seen here. And in keeping with the growing informality of commissioned portraiture, the Queen has also appeared in a manner that was unthinkable to ancient and early modern monarchs, smiling, or as we saw previously with eyes closed, or with naturally aged skin incised with wrinkles. The queen's willingness to be portrayed by non-traditional artists in non-traditional ways is something that I think has particular resonance with the portraits we will see shortly of Jacinda Ardern. Given the close associations between traditional portrait imagery and monarchical power, it will not surprise you that marble busts, equestrian portraits, and life-size paintings have not been widely embraced by elected leaders in modern democracies like New Zealand. And yet traditional forms of portraiture, above all sculpted busts, and life-size paintings have been used to commemorate some women who have made significant contributions 
to New Zealand society, including Kate Shepherd. Her 1905 photograph has been used as the basis of not only her depiction on the $10, on the $10 bill, but a more recent portrait bust executed in bronze. The first female governor general, Dame Kath Tizard, was painted by Glenda Randerson after her term in office. Randerson suggested the portrait, knowing that only photographs were commissioned of retiring governors general. Tizard is shown here at home in Government House, Wellington. The rich domesticity of the setting with its stylized patterns, bright colors, and landscape view through the window are all unusual in portraits of leaders. These are features that are common in portraits of well-to-do women. Women have traditionally been shown indoors. Instead of the angular folds and hard lines typical of male leader portraits, Tizard's portrait swarms with soft undulations in the folds of her dress, the flips of her color, the waves of her hair, the just slight ripple of a smile on her face. Feminine detail dominates, giving the picture a warmth and polished but relaxed formality. She may be shown wearing a silver fern pen and a partly obscured medal, but the power of the portrait is not in her status as governor general, but as a powerful woman who leads in a no-nonsense manner. It was, after all, during her tenure in office that the practice of bowing to the Governor General ended with her stating, no New Zealander should have to bow to another. That painted portrait does not hang today in Government House in Wellington, but an old Government House now inhabited by the University of Auckland. By far the most common portrait type of elected leaders in New Zealand today is the official photograph. And these were made to balance the fine line between authority and approachability so valued in democratic leaders. These photographs have been commissioned by governments since the 19th century and are often displayed in an institutional context. This is the case with the photographs of governors general in government house in Wellington, prime ministers at number 10 Downing Street, and American presidents in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. And what I'm showing you here, I'm not showing you the whole succession of governors general, but the four female governors general and their official portraits. And as you can see, they are for the most part pictured in regalia associated with their office. Sylvia Cartwright alone eschews the badges of office for a familiar silver fern brooch and a Maori carving. While traditional official portraits, like the ones we've seen from ancient Rome and early modern Europe, tend to depict the subject with a very serious expression, the smiles seen here point to the importance attached today to approachable leaders. At the same time, you see these women are dressed for business. There are no jewel-encrusted gowns, no elaborate hairstyles that might distract. Official painted portraits of democratically elected leaders are almost never commissioned today. Not only more expensive than photographs, painted portraits tend to involve the subject sitting to the artist, and it is rarely done in a single setting. They tend to be commissioned by traditional institutions keen to narrate tradition, lineage, and national history, and they tend to be commissioned at the end of a leader's time in office. The most important contemporary example of this is for American presidents. The White House has its own very important collection, 
of uh, portraits of former presidents and also first ladies. And I'm showing you, um, I think it's quite an ethereal portrait of the former first lady, Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, so the White House has its own collection, but it is not, um, it's not comprehensive. But the Smithsonian has the National Portrait Gallery at Washington. And since the 1990s, the National Portrait Gallery has commissioned portraits of all outgoing um, American presidents. And I'm showing you this one, a spectacular, very, very um, strikingly modern portrait of former First Lady Michelle Obama. And I think we'll notice here, um, again, a portrait that is invested in showcasing approachability alongside modernity and power, but also a penchant for depicting powerful women in white outfits. And if you go back and you look at Hillary Clinton, what she was wearing at strategic times when she was um, on campaign, white suits. And if you think of what Melania Trump wore um, the night that, I think the night that Trump was elected, she wore a white suit as well. And I should say, just as an aside, if this is of interest to you, um, the White House, so this was commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. And this is at the moment going on a tour around America along with the other portrait of Obama. Now the White House has commissioned its own totally different portraits of Obama and Michelle that are being unveiled in September. So keep your eyes peeled, it'll be great to see um, who the portrait artists are and what they look like. In England, the system of commissioning painted portraits is ad hoc. This is the case for Richard Stone's 2009 portrait of Margaret Thatcher. This was ordered many years after she had completed her time in office and it was ordered by Gordon Brown to hang at number 10 Downing Street. Female prime ministers and those occupying other formal offices of state have a very difficult balancing act to play. We've seen this happening historically from the Renaissance. And I've talked about this sort of um, negotiation between female ideals and male paradigms of leadership. In female portraits, these references to male paradigms of leadership can sometimes be quite subtle. Stone's portrait here commemorates Thatcher just after her Falklands War glory. The military resonances of such official portraits thus remain inflected as they did too in the Armada portrait of Elizabeth. Painted portraits of recent and current leaders continue to quote these age-old conventions of representing authority, even as social and political agendas have changed dramatically. Symbols associated with office are common, as are an upright posture, a focused gaze, and dominant hands. Clothing tends to be very tidy, polished, as controlled as the posture, and the hair too controlled brushed neatly, kept in place. And yet clothing, hair, and jewelry is also central to images of women. One thing that strikes me about the portraits of first ladies, and we're looking at Margaret Thatcher rather than portraits of first ladies, but of first ladies is a much greater relish in fashion than, in, than what would be allowed or expected in images of elected female prime ministers. So what about the New Zealand context? It took until 1997 for a female prime minister to lead the New Zealand parliament, Jenny Shipley. In Martin Ball's 2002 portrait, commissioned on the occasion of her retirement, her authority is stressed in male terms. The head takes center stage and threatens to poke out of the top of the canvas. The outlines are sharp and the shoulders are broad. Ball's use of close cropping 
successfully aggrandizes the sitter and positions the viewer inevitably underneath her. Even her haircut and features bear, com bear comparisons to a male ideal, short cropped hair, broad face, strong chin. But there are those female flourishes, most notably that slick of red lipstick situated right in the center of the canvas, and also the earrings and the brooch. Ball's anatomical love of detail creates an unapologetic impression of female leadership, but also a human portrait. Helen Clark was the first elected female Prime Minister of New Zealand. The official photographs of her present her as a female leader who has the qualities of a male leader without rejecting her femininity. Even Helen Clark, known for eschewing dresses, recognized this and appears here in the 2008 campaign official image in a splash of red lipstick that war paint introduced at the beginning of the talk. But even while female leaders might soften their hair, wear lipstick, and sport tasteful jewelry, they do not tend to be portrayed as overtly feminine. Now this is what makes Jacinda Ardern a very interesting final case study. Not only because she is the rare, very rare, elected female leader who has maintained long hair, but also shown a taste for just not just power suits, but soft skirts, solids and florals. As a pregnant woman in the office of prime minister, not only her femininity, but her maternity has been on show to the world. She has been called and this is in the Vogue March 2018 issue that accompanied the Derek Henderson photo. They called her the anti-Trump. And the differences in their politics are as marked as the differences in their portrait personas as this juxtaposition demonstrates. On the left, this is Trump's official photograph during his time in office, a stern expression dominating body language, heavy-handed national symbolism, all in contrast to Jacinda's friendly smile. But notice that she too wears a smart suit, bright colors, and is impeccably tailored and polished in every aspect of her clothing, her makeup, and her hair. Jacinda Ardern has also been a source of inspiration to artists who have painted her not as a commissioned subject for a, an official government institution, but just as a fascinating subject of an artwork in its own right. The Auckland painter Liz Maw celebrated for her mythic theme, mythic themes and searing detail, portrayed Ardern in 2014 when she was then just a list MP. And I should say this portrait is in a Wellington, a private Wellington collection. In a large full length portrait, she is shown not wearing that neat power suit we saw in the official photograph just a moment ago, but in a very casual striped dress, black jacket, and rather worn in knee high boots. Ma's interest in her intent, searching expression as if digging in with a combination of pragmatism and empathy and her pointed hand movements are remarkable. This provides a strong connection with Roman imperial portraits and ideals of leadership that valued oratory, rhetoric, persuasion, but instead of complementing that with armor and muscles, the modern female leader asks that the viewer focus on her words and ideas rather than her appearance. Or do they? 
Derek Henderson's photograph takes a different approach, connecting the new Labour Prime Minister to the land in a way that seems to invoke but also reinvents traditional European rulership of land that we saw in portraits of Elizabeth. Jacinda is not controlling over land, over man. She is part of it, and her bodily form mirrors the undulating landscape behind her. John Ward Knox's portrait in oil on silk, simply titled Jacinda, departs from this monumental approach to a far more introspective study. Painted on two separate layers of translucent silk that elude the presentation of a single monolithic form, Jacinda is presented not as a leader, but a person. Layers of thoughts as she lightly holds onto a hair tie and stares toward the window in one layer and eyes closed, hand on cheek, in a searching look on the other layer. Based on photographs that Ward Knox took of her in her Auckland kitchen, this is not an image about access to a type of leadership or claim to authority. This is a portrait about the insistence of basic humanity and humility in the person behind the role of leader. This is in part possible, well, this is in part possible for the artist to be so successful because Ward Knox has known Jacinda, his subject, for many years before she became prime minister. Now, this is um, a complex, and as I suggested, a very successful portrait, and it was exhibited in Australia's prestigious Archibald Prize um, in, in that competition in Sydney in 2020. Remarkably, I think, both Liz Maul and John Ward Knox gave their portraits the same title, Jacinda, stressing that this was a portrait of a person rather than a role. But the role of prime minister and the significance of women occupying that role after the suffrage movement accomplished equal voting rights for women in 1893 should not be lost on us. The official portraits of Kate Shepard given actual currency on the $10 note are a constant reminder. In 2018, the 125th anniversary of this watershed achievement was commemorated in a manner that Kate Shepard would have applauded. A triple portrait of the three women who had served as New Zealand prime ministers. This is not commemorated in a marble or a bronze statue or a larger than life painting, but in a photograph. Gathering all three women together, they are presented as a unit of female empowerment despite their different political views. With wide smiles, they show pride in their political achievement while also presenting solidarity. They may be wearing, as Helen Clark put it, paint for such an historic photograph, but this is, after all, part of the apparatus of public politics expected in female leaders who must negotiate lipstick and hemlines, haircuts, and brooch symbolism. The traditional and innovative, the hard and smooth, the authoritative and accessible, these are aspects of leadership and portraiture that leaders today all have to negotiate. But for women, this is far more complex and difficult as I've just really only begun to tease out in this short talk. Visual connections are important in portraiture, and visual lineages of leadership and conventions of portraiture that go back to ancient Rome that focused on male leadership. These qualities and connections are still paraded in portraits today. By putting these three trailblazers together, we see how female leadership 
is about more than individual women serving in office, but the optics of women serving as effective leaders. New Zealand has a long history of powerful women and empowering women, but it has only really been in the last 30 years or so that women have occupied the highest political offices in this country and been commemorated as such in their portraits. I will just end by saying that this subject is not only timely with a current female prime minister, but with the many women who lead institutions all over the country, in businesses, universities, on the Supreme Court, and in our communities. It is fitting that the founding director of the New Zealand Portrait Gallery was a woman, Avonal McKinnon, who we've heard about tonight. She died last year, and I'm sure you all, um, all know her well. Um, and as you know, as, as I do, because I was lucky to have known her as well, she was a formidable force who combined grit with femininity, authority with accessibility. And suitably too, as you see in the exhibition just adjacent, Avonall was the subject of an array of portraits throughout her life from when she was a girl. And I'm showing you here just one of these portraits. This is an elegant portrait painted of her in 2012. I was privileged to have known and worked with Avonall and am honored to have been asked to present this lecture to you tonight. I would also like to um, very much acknowledge that this is the Ovenden Lecture. Thank you very much for having me and for me too being a part of this lineage, this lecture series. I'm very honored. Thank you. And I'd also like to acknowledge Janine Parkinson. And this is another powerful woman um, now um, with the reins of the New Zealand um, Portrait Gallery. So thank you very much. I'd love to know where it lives. It was published in the New Zealand Herald to mark the 125th um, anniversary of um, women gaining the right to vote. But there should be there should be a version of it here in the New Zealand Portrait Gallery, perhaps. Thank you, Erin. That was great. Um, wouldn't you say, however, that women have a great advantage over men, at least in modern times, in that they don't have to dress like this? <laughs> They've got all these options. They can wear lipstick, they can have earrings, they can yeah. have brooches, and a whole bunch of other things as well. <laughs> How would you address that? Yeah. Um, I, I would say that it's, it's quite interesting when um, female leaders go to um, very formal occasions. They, they, they do tend to wear suits. They tend to mimic men um, in wearing suits. But I agree, they have range. And as politicians, this is probably um, part, part of an arsenal that can be very effective for a leader in reaching a really broad audience. Where you're, um, I guess if you had a man going around um, in shorts on the campaign trail, it would make people feel pretty anxious in some ways. Potentially, it might. I don't know. Um, so they do have more um, variety, but it certainly seems that, as I said, sort of elected female leaders, in general, they still tend to be reasonably conservative. But I, if, if like, if you compare, you know, um, Angela Merkel's clothes with Jacinda's, um, they're far, far more conservative than Jacinda Ardern wears. Um, I find her really interesting to look at her clothing choices. And she's certainly, 
presented a much softer sartorial look than um, other female leaders. And I'm thinking of people like Hillary Clinton and um, oh, who was the most recent female prime minister of England? Theresa May, yes. But she, she did some interesting things with clothes too. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, this is a cheats question. Um, I'm her wife. Uh, husband, sorry. <laughs> I should know this already. But um, with Elizabeth, um, she had the dichotomy of power and beauty, mm -hmm. and because um, of her, you know, she had, uh, the prospect of getting married, and yeah. so there was that dynamic. But you seem to imply that um, you know, with Helen Clark and the war paint, that beauty is very much still the currency that has to be. Um, spent by female leaders now, um, does that mean that beauty is power? I think absolutely, but I think too, it, so the question essentially is, you know, is there still currency um, for women leaders in terms of attractiveness, in terms of the prevailing ideals of beauty? And I think I think yes, to some extent. But if you look at a lot of elected female leaders, they would never be on the cover of Vogue, okay? Um, yes, Jacinda has a big Vogue spread. We, uh, one cannot see Theresa May or Angela Merkel um, doing that. Um, it, there's a lot, I think, at, at play, you know, having a far more youthful leader, but I think Helen Clark acknowledging that she ha she feels like she has to wear lipstick. So even though she's not in any way trying to conform to prevailing ideals of beauty, she recognizes that she needs to provide some concessions to social ideals of femininity. And one way you can do that in a nutshell is a, a little slap of paint. Thanks very much. I, I think one interesting uh, subset that you might want to think about is perhaps looking at Maori leadership. Yes. I'm thinking about Maori Queen and Princess Tapuia and other Maggie, uh, you know, other well known Maori leaders. Yes. Right, a sort of cultural no, I, contrast and comparison. No, I. Great use of jewelry. Uh, I think that that is a wonderful suggestion and to look at Moko. Um, I think that, and general um, aspects of Māori adornment and com yeah, I think that would be a really rich topic. Yes, I agree. Uh, can I make uh, two comments? First sure. of all, the first comment is very straightforward. Just to thank you very much oh. for your talk, which is so um, set. Um, so many uh, themes running all at once. Um, but I have two things. One, one is simply a statement. I have a wonderful portrait photograph of uh, Helen uh, Clark holding hands with Bill Clinton oh. and looking completely powerless. Oh, <laughs> right. Um, I purchased it a long time ago from a charity auction held by what was then called the Dominion, what became the Dominion Post, by one of their staff photographers. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, I've often thought there should be an occasion when it could be shown in the gallery. Um, but she might not appreciate its appearing in public, so I'll keep it at home for a while longer. I have a, a specific question about a specific portrait that you showed, the Armada portrait of Queen Elizabeth I. Can you bring it up again? Um, I've often wondered about this um, painting. A tiny matter, yeah. uh, but one that's always been of interest to me because one of the things we know about paintings from the early modern period, and in fact through into the 19th century, is that artists put in them objects, dresses, things, um, that signified something. Yeah. And I've always wondered what that egg-shaped thing is behind her left shoulder, just there, looking like a sort of chocolate oh. Easter egg. <laughs> What does it mean? Has anyone written about it? I've been, everything else seems to me to be kind of obvious. As you said, the hand on the wall, on the world, the painting of the Armada, the crown uh, by her right elbow. 
But I what is that? I, as I read it, it's a finial on the chair. Nothing more than that. That. No, no, no. Well, the other thing it could be is it could be an exotica. It could be something like a coconut shell. No, I wasn't trying to. I wasn't trying to embarrass you. I just wonder. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not. I, no, no, some no. Some specialist had actually written about the contents of this painting. Well, um, the the portraits of, of Elizabeth have been endlessly mined by art historians, most famously by Sir Roy Strong, and I can I cannot recall um, discussion of that particular object, but I will go back and I will confer. To, to see what's said, but it's not um, it's not something I, I know. Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, yes, I'm fascinated by your lecture. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Um, but with the three modern New Zealand Prime Ministers, um, it seems to me you've left out a dimension here, and that yes. is their personalities. Oh. And um, I would give a completely different commentary, um, having known them all. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, you know, my commentary on their clothing, particularly, yes. would be quite different. Yeah. And so I think perhaps an additional factor to consider is their personalities. And the, the modern way is that people can express their personalities more. So it's not necessarily a f sort of feminist thing. It's, it might be more about the ability to express your personality more in a political environment that was much less uh, able to be done. I, I, I think that's a fair point, and certainly I think when I look at Martin Ball's portrait of Ginny Shipley, it seems very much, much a product of its time, um, you know, for, for that era, and, you know, and in that era too, sort of the power suit where women were trying to gain currency alongside men and being taken seriously. And so are you suggesting that in today's society, women really do have more options to express themselves in their clothing. Yes, I totally agree. And that's, I think, certainly, I, I very much agree with you there. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, uh, uh, thank you very much indeed for this lecture tonight. I think um, it's provoked a great deal of interest. We all have um, our own views on what Prime Ministers should represent officially. And it, they tread a very fine line in their clothing uh, between attracting criticism and, uh, and fulfilling the role of the office and being taken seriously. It's very hard and it's also true for women in many positions of authority that they have to dress with care uh, to avoid criticism and to not become, their, for not to have their clothing become the topic of conversation. Um, but this has been fascinating. It's really wonderful for us to have you back in the gallery after more than 10 years and to see what you've um, been exploring over that period. Thank you very much for a fascinating lecture and welcome back. We hope to see you again. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I'd like to uh, invite you all to stay and join us when, in some Prosecco or wine or orange juice or water and some nibbles, uh, which will be circulating on platters shortly. So do stay and talk about the evening. Thank you. And sorry.